Oh, 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 can you believe it? We are already at the final curtain of the third season of the new Germany. My name is Florian Bigge and it is with mixed feelings that I present the sixth episode of this special podcast series. In today's episode, we tackle the complex and urgent issue of extremism. We are privileged to have Professor Frank McDonough as our expert guest. And of course, none of this would be possible without our fantastic hosts, Katja Hoyer and Oliver Modi. Welcome to the show, dear listeners. Welcome, everyone. Picture an elderly lady. She is 75 years old and has shoulder-length white hair. She's a retired teacher, has a doctorate in theology, and lives in a wood-panelled house in the small town of Fluha in Saxony. Now picture an extremist, suspected of being the ringleader of a terrorist cell called the United Patriots, who are accused of attempting to procure ex-military personnel, weapons and explosives to overthrow the German government in a violent coup. Put the two images together and you end up with Elisabeth Ehr, pensioner and conspiracy theorist, dubbed terror granny by the press. Absorbing as all this may be, Katja, if you spend much longer setting the scene, people are going to think we've turned into one of those New York Times true crime podcasts. <laughs> You're so rude. Years of living in Germany have clearly had a detrimental effect on your British politeness, Oliver. Well, years of living in Germany have also taught me that German efficiency is a bit of a canard. It seems that includes opening a podcast. Well, I shall do my best to restore your faith in the virtues of my birth country. I was just coming to the point. Get on with it then. <laughs> I shall. Today's episode of the Kerber Stiftung podcast in New Germany is on extremism. It's a concept that's traditionally associated with young men with shaved heads, black boots and a bomber jacket. And that's why my introduction began with the opposite, namely an elderly woman with long white hair who appeared in court in socks and a tracksuit. The concept of extremism is incredibly complex, particularly in Germany. So the tale of terror granny seemed a good opener. That Dan Brown masterpiece of narrative picture painting was brought to you by Katja Hoyer, a German historian based in Britain. And it was rudely interrupted by Oliver Moody, a British journalist based in Berlin. Together we discuss Germany's past, present and future, one theme at a time. And as you've already alluded to, today's theme is not an easy one to pin down. The Verfassungsschutz, Germany's domestic intelligence agency, defines extremism as thoughts and actions that, and I quote, aim at abolishing the basic values of liberal democracy. Which sounds pretty straightforward, but really isn't. No. There are a lot of issues that make this definition difficult to work with. And the first of them is the concept of Verfassungsschutz itself. I described it as an intelligence agency, but that's a little bit misleading. The word literally means protection of the constitution, and that is pretty much the organization's job, monitoring potential threats to Germany's post-war democratic order. So while it does do some clandestine stuff like wiretaps and infiltration, most of the time its staff are keeping track of stuff that's happening out in the open, speeches or articles or social media posts, and evaluating whether they're hostile to the values embodied in the constitution. So for one thing, it is an intrinsically political and quite legalistic process. And if you read the reports that occasionally leak out on the targets they're observing, You'll find all this public or semi-public information marshaled into neat little paragraphs that are supposed to illustrate how each point of the Constitution has been violated, whether it's human dignity or the rule of law or whatever. And for another thing, the Verfassungsschutz is primarily designed to protect the state and not individual people. That distinction does frequently get elided in practice because the Constitution sets out various protective rights for individuals and groups, so white supremacy or, or anti-Semitism or radical misogyny can be construed as anti-constitutional, but it does put the central emphasis on the structures of the system. And that establishes quite a high and specific threshold for extremism. Yeah, for a historian, the, the concept is also very difficult to work with, because if you define extremism as anti-state 
activism. It's very difficult to apply that to different time periods. So if you take the SPD, for example, the Social Democratic Party, which is the oldest of Germany's main parties still in existence today, is now obviously seen as a, you know, as a mainstream democratic party. But in its early days, in the second half of the 19th century, it was actually viewed as an extremist endeavour by many people, including by the state itself. And many of its supporters thought that the changes they wanted could only be brought about through revolution. Although the party itself did soon decide to follow a legal path. Yeah, so that still meant that some people in that party were um, you know, of an opinion that you needed to use violence and, and you know, what we would now deem to be extremist methods to bring about the change that they, that they wanted. So the first German chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, labelled them Reichsfeinde, which literally means enemies of the state and banned the party temporarily. Uh, whilst few today, of course, would regard the SPD as an extremist endeavour, but in the early phase of the German Empire, um, which did enjoy a broad consensus from the pop- population, they supported a minority view which was opposed to the existing order and could therefore be labelled extremist. This definitional question gets even more complicated if you look at eras when extremism was the political norm. The Nazi era with its genocidal racism, its intolerance of any views outside its own doctrine and its use of state violence to pursue its aims is one of the most extreme forms of government ever implemented. So one might be tempted then to turn the definition of extremism on its head and argue that anybody fighting the Nazi regime was therefore not an extremist. But amongst the regime's opponents were also many hardline communists. So, you know, it doesn't really make sense to say that, say that they stopped being extremists just because they were about to, you know, kind of do the extremist bidding they're, they're bringing about of a communist dictatorship to replace a fascist one. So it's incredibly complex. So you can see why so many academics have, have problems with the term. For example, Professor Andrea Gavrich, a political scientist from Gießen University, argues that the concept of extremism as we understand it today has to be seen in the context of West Germany's post-war history, in the context of the Cold War. And in her view, it certainly represents the fear of the return of forces that want to overthrow the basic order of the Federal Republic of Germany. That was indisputably the case in the early post-war years. The fear that the young democracy established in West Germany in 1949 might be undermined by extremist forces was not entirely unjustified. No, and uh, Konrad Adenauer, the first West German chancellor, dealt with it pretty effectively, but in a manner that is still seen as uh, somewhat controversial today. Um, So, for example, the fact that he had to deal with a society that was still very deeply Nazified, but also war-weary and and apolitical, meant that um, the idea was there that basically you just ban any um, thoughts or actions or political groups that are deemed to be extremists and against the state. And, you know, the thought was there that you might be able to get away with that because the populace was still quite uh, willing to kind of abdicate their responsibilities to the to the government. So, for example, a survey in 1948 showed that 57% of Germans in the American sector of occupation uh, still believed then, so three years after the Second World War was over, that national socialism um, had been a good idea. And only 28% said that they rejected it as an ideology. So whilst many opinions remained radical, the voting did not have somewhat surprisingly at the same time. At the same time from the the 1950s onwards, Adenauer quite deliberately allowed a great number of former Nazi party members and Third Reich functionaries to creep back into public office on the basis that you couldn't just create an army or a judiciary or a transport ministry from scratch and staff them purely with heroes of the resistance. And Adenauer famously said of this, you don't throw out dirty water until you have clean water. And the idea behind that is that he wanted people who knew how to run stuff. And he figured it would be better to have these old networks working under him where he could observe them than against him. So in 1951, the Adenauer government passed the so-called 131 law, which allowed for people who'd been public servants under Nazi rule to be reinstated as long as they hadn't been uh, blackballed during the denazification process. And as a result, most institutions of the Bonn Republic 
from the ministries to the public prosecutor's offices subsequently came to be numerically dominated by former officials from the Third Reich. So in many ways, lots of what we would now deem people with extremist views were um, kind of integrated into Adenauer's um, young democracy. But he also cracked down on um, extremists outside of the system, mostly through bans. Uh, so the only two party bans which happened in the Federal Republic of Germany since 1949 happened under Adenauer's watch. That's the SRP, the Socialist Reich Party, um, which saw itself as a successor um, to the Nazi Party. That was banned in 1952. Um, and the KPD, the German Communist Party, which was banned in 1956, despite the fact that both parties had fairly low electoral support and one could therefore argue that they weren't particularly dangerous. Neither of those two parties managed to resurface afterwards. The KPD tried and they came back as the DKP, the, the German Communist Party in 1968. It was closely watched by the Verfassungsschutz, but never became particularly, or has never become really particularly influential since. Um, so given the apparent results of those party bans, do you think that they can still work as a means to tackle extremism today? I mean, the, 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 the primary background to this question now is obviously quite an intense debate going on in, in German public discourse about whether the Verfassungsschutz should, should just ban the whole AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland Party, to protect the political system or whether this would in itself be an authoritarian and anti-democratic overreaction. And personally, I think this debate pretty much completely misses the point because regardless of whether you think banning the AFD would be desirable or, or legally tenable, the practical result of such a ban would almost certainly be political carnage. I mean, that the genie's out of the bottle and you can't just pretend that a highly organised party with deeply networked structures in every constituency and support from 22% of the voting public does not exist. You'd get front parties, you'd probably get attempts to take over mainstream parties from the inside and you'd get a massive wave of anti-democratic radicalisation. But above all, I think it would be a colossal admission that German politics has failed on its own terms. What do you think? Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I also think that people who cite these two early bans, the, the, the bans of kind of extreme left-wing and right-wing parties in the early phase of the Federal Republic, are missing the point as well. I mean, you could, of course, and you still can uh, legally ban parties. Um, but the difference is that the Young Republic didn't really face a huge amount of kind of extremist political thought anyway. As you just said, the AFD is currently, as we're recording this episode, polling at about 22%. So we have over a fifth of the electorate currently on track to vote for what many would deem a far-right party. Uh, when you look back at the 1950s, uh, there were never such numbers. I mean, the state felt more threatened because the you know era of Nazism had only just come to an end. And it was felt that democracy needed to be stabilised first first before it's robust enough to kind of be able to deal with with a challenge like that. But at the same time, the, the numbers were just not that great. So if you take an example of uh, the West German branch of the FDO, the Free German Youth, which was a, a mass movement um, in East Germany at the time, so a socialist movement, but also had a Western branch, uh, that was, for instance, banned in 1951. It did momentarily try to resist, so it organised some, some further demonstrations in West Germany. Um, but was then pretty quickly um, eradicated when a 21-year-old uh, worker from Munich called Philipp Müller was shot dead by police at an event in Essen in 1952 and two more protesters were also badly wounded by the shooting. That shocked people so deeply that basically it just dissipated because it was never that big to start with. And you can see this across society at the time. So the Verfassungsschutz, for instance, counted 76,000 organised extremists in 1954. Um, and 10 years later, only 21,000 were counted, even in the official figures. So this shows that there is some uh, extremism in society, but it's never in the same numbers. And therefore, it was easier to kind of crack down on and, and ban away, which I don't think you can do with something as big as the AFD today that is highly organised and, and widely supported. Yeah. The next big open challenge from extremism came from the second half of the 1960s, when a uh, 
particularly you had the student protests of 68 and heavy opposition to the CDU-SPD grand coalition government under the Chancellor Kurt Georg Kiesinger. And that led to the coalescence of the so-called Außerparlamentarische Opposition or extra-parliamentary opposition, a broad tangle of radical leftist groups that campaigned against the institutions of the Federal Republic. And from 1969, Willy Brandt, the new Social Democratic Chancellor, adopted a mixture of tactics to try and control the dissent, ranging from reforms of universities and expansion of the social welfare system to the so-called Radikalen Erlass, or radical degree, under which public servants were banned from membership of groups deemed to be anti-constitutional, with a very vague legal definition of what anti-constitutional actually meant. And the most notorious of these splinter groups was the Red Army Faction, more commonly known outside Germany as the Bader-Meinhof Gang, after two of its early leaders, Andreas Bader and Ulrike Meinhof. And over the next two or three decades, the RAF carried out a wave of assassinations, bombings and other attacks, killing about three dozen people, including Hans Martin Schleyer, a wealthy industrialist and president of the Confederation of German Industries. Probably more damage was done in numerical terms by another far-left outfit, the Revolutionary Cells, which worked with Palestinian terrorists to hijack a passenger plane on its way from Tel Aviv to Paris and diverted it to Entebbe International Airport in Uganda in 1976, which led to an Israeli commando raid on the airport in which Benjamin Netanyahu's brother Yonatan was shot dead. Yeah, I find it really interesting how the state responded to to these things. I mean, initially with the student movements in the in the late 1960s, you had Willy Brandt who sort of responded really with politics, if you will, you know, by reforming things, by opening up, by by entering into dialogue and diffused, I think, in lots of ways, the, you know, the movement. Obviously, it boiled down to a radical core as a result of that, because you basically had most of the people uh, who were more moderate kind of responding to Brandt's reforms and, and also just growing up, frankly. I mean, this is, you know, young people who are um, at university in, in the late 60s you know, suddenly become kind of middle class professionals in the 70s and also just go home. Um, but Schmidt's response later, so the um, Helmut Schmidt, the, the successor to, to Willy Brandt, um, had to then deal with uh, with these really radical groups and, and took a very, very uncompromising stance. So he wouldn't negotiate, for example, with hostage takers, um, ignored hunger strikes uh, that were happening in German prisons and so on. Um, and I'm wondering whether... You know, what you think of those two approaches, whether maybe when we look at today's uh, activists, such as the the Klima Kleber, for example, so the the kind of radical environmental activists, um, do you think that that needs a, a politics response? So that should uh, kind of politics give in and, and come up with a form or, or more of the uncompromising approach that, you know, we saw under Schmidt, so arrests and, and kind of really a crackdown? I think it's quite important to be clear what we're talking about in each instance, right? I mean, Brandt and Schmidt were confronted with what you could very reasonably call terrorist groups in a literal sense, you know, prepared to use violence to sow terror for political purposes. And in the cases where that does happen today, I think you still see the German authorities using the full force of the law to deal with it. The one really good example of that would be the Union of Patriots coup you mentioned at the top of this podcast, um, which included your your terror granny, but also a former a- a- MP from the AFD. But on the whole, much as people in Germany may, depending on their particular political tastes, find the, the radical climate activists or the AFD activists annoying or, or even dangerous, they are pretty clearly being prosecuted when they do break the laws of the land. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting as well that many people have talked about, you know, when when uh, the climate activists in particular, when they first started, um, you know, with more radical action, just, such as vandalism or the, the closing down of roads, many people have kind of, you know, pointed at the fact that they might turn into some sort of green army faction. But obviously, you know, they haven't radicalized in the same way that, that we've seen it in the 1970s. But it will be interesting to see how the, how the state will respond to them in the future, because that debate you know, keeps going on with a, you know, there should be a harsh crackdown on them or a change of politics as a as a response. I think at this point, it would be good to come back to the extreme right, um, which didn't sort of entirely die away forever. 
in the 1950s. Um, and in fact, from the 1980s, there was a sort of miniature political resurgence of certainly very dry right-wing outfits, um, the the most notable of which was a party known as Die Republikaner, the Republicans, launched in Bavaria by a journalist, MP, and a forest tourism lobbyist with the wonderful name Franz Handlos, um, who broke away from the mainstream centre-right group in the Bundestag in, in 1983. And it was it was basically a kind of external militant wing of the Bavarian CSU. It, it reminds me in a British context of UKIP or, or the Reform Party today. It made a bit of electoral headway. It got... 7.1% of the vote in the 1989 European parliamentary election, 10.9% in the Baden-Württemberg state election three years after that. But by today's standards, I think the Republicana would fit quite comfortably into the spectrum of European right-wing nationalist immigration sceptic parties occupied by the likes of Marine Le Pen or Viktor Orban. The more hardcore and obviously ethno-nationalist group was the Union of the German Nation, or DVU, which had a tendency to downplay and relativize the Third Reich and flirted pretty heavy-handedly with anti-Semitism and other forms of xenophobia. The DVU's zenith was 12.9% of the vote in the 1998 Saxony-Anhalt state election, which was at the time the best performance by a party of the extreme right since the foundation of the Federal Republic, but it did fade away after that. Yeah, and that's, of course, in in what was East Germany, in, in the territories that, that were part of the of the GDR, the German Democratic Republic. And that's also where you saw um, around half of all right-wing crimes committed after 1990. Um, so there's a particularly virulent strand of, strand of uh, kind of right-wing extremism that also grows in the, in the former East at that time. The most extreme uh, sort of incarnation of that is the NSU or the Nationalsozialistische Untergrund, the National Socialist Underground, which was accused of 10 murders and several other crimes, such as 43 attempted murder cases, uh, three bombings that they undertook in Nuremberg uh, and, and Cologne, and 15 armed robberies. So in a really extremist outfit that, that worried many people in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and another right-wing party um, that also uh, resurged and is still around today um, is the NPD, or the National Democratic Party of Germany, now called the Homeland, or die Heimat in German. Um, they're kind of outright neo-Nazi um, and managed to, because they are so radical, basically never really managed to win enough votes on a federal level um, because they never managed to cross the 5% threshold that you need for representation in the German parliament in the Bundestag. Um, but they did manage to get into uh, state parliaments 11 times, including um, in um, seven West German state parliaments. So this can't be entirely put down to an uh, to a sort of Eastern problem. Um, but they also managed in Saxony and Mecklenburg-Vorpommern in uh, 20, uh, 2004 and 2011, uh, so two of the, the former East German states. Um, so again, not something that is on the scale as, as AFD support today, but because of the radical nature of their program, something that really worried um, the authorities. Yeah, as as you said there, I think if you if you go back over that mini survey of extremism, in the Federal Republic in East Germany, there's really nothing on anything like the same level in terms of organisational capacity and popular support as the AFD is now. And it's important to bear in mind that it's very much an evolving party um, in a similar way to how the Republicana hived off from the Bavarian CSU. The AFD was originally a splinter group that broke away from the CDU in 2013. And back then, its real raison d'etre was the Eurozone crisis, and in particular, the use of the German taxpayers' money to bail out the currency zone's weaker members. The AFD's radicalization has come in fits and starts. It got its first big break with the European migration crisis of 2015 to 2016, when one of its leaders at the time, Frau Petri, established a grip on the party and turned it into the... 
the predominant political vehicle for, for anti-immigration sentiment. And the party has been through a couple of lurches further to the right since then, uh, first under Alexander Gowland, a kind of tweedy journalist and former CDU political civil servant, uh, who interestingly enough wrote his doctoral thesis on uh, the principle of legitimacy in state practice since the Congress of Vienna. And now uh, it has uh, shifted again to the right under the leadership of Alice Weidel and Tino Schrupala, um, also kind of under the rhetorical influence of Björn Hooker, its notorious state leader in the East German state of Thuringia. Party got 12.6% of the vote at the 2017 Bundestag election, which made it the largest opposition group. And its popularity continued to rise over the next couple of years or so before it got clobbered by the pandemic, which had a notable impact on its performance at the last Bundestag election in 2021. But it's now very much back. Um, it's stronger than ever, in fact, at the time we're Recording this, it's it's the second most popular party nationally, uh, some distance ahead of the SPD and the Greens. Um, it's only a couple of points behind the CDU-CSU in polling for the European parliamentary election in June, and it is streets ahead in the running for three East German state elections in the autumn. Germany's nervousness about this great challenge from the right clearly stems from its history. And the fact that the only other full democracy attempted on German soil, the Weimar Republic, was brought down by the Nazis and their extremist ideology continues to haunt the country. So much so that comparisons to the 1920s and the 1930s, so-called Weimarer Verhältnisse, are frequently drawn today. But how helpful is this really? We've invited an expert guest to find out. And that guest is the British historian Professor Frank McDonough, an internationally renowned expert on the Third Reich. He was born in Liverpool and studied history at Balliol College, Oxford, and gained a PhD from Lancaster University. He has written several critically acclaimed books on the Third Reich, including The Gestapo, The Myth and Reality of Hitler's Secret Police, Hitler and the Rise of the Nazi Party, and Sophie Scholl, a woman who defied Hitler. More recently, he has completed a trilogy of books on German history from 1918 to 1945. Two volumes covered the Hitler years from 1933 to 1945. And his most recent book covered the Weimar period from 1918 to 1933 and is called The Weimar Years. Professor McDonough also runs an immensely popular account on X, the artist formerly known as Twitter, where he showcases events and photographs from history for a wide readership on a daily basis. And the US History Network has placed the account, which is at FXMC1957, in the top 30 most popular historical Twitter accounts in the world. Professor McDonough, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Having met you a few times at, at history festivals, there's one question that is often on my mind, but I've never dared to ask, but I feel now's the time. So how does a lifelong Liverpudlian become as deeply interested in German history as you clearly are? Ah, well, it's an interesting story, really, because uh, when I was about four, my dad took me to Liverpool Town Hall and he, he, we went inside and then he pointed to, there were a list of names of people who died in the First World War. And he pointed to one name, which was Francis McDonough. And he said, that's your great uncle. He was killed in the war. And so I said, what, 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 what was the war about? And he said, it was a war between uh, Britain and France and, and Germany. And I said, but why, why did Germany want to kill him? And he said, oh, you know, they were, they were badly led at the time. And so it stuck in my mind, you know, that really, in a sense, you know, it was a key moment, really, that, that my great uncle had been killed by somebody in Germany. And I wanted to know, you know, why did this happen? And so I got really interested in German history, mainly on, on the origins of the, the two world wars. You know, why did the wars happen? Could they have been prevented? And if they'd been prevented, then, you know, that would have been a great thing. And it, it would, you know, it would have meant that, you know, the world was a better place. So I, I suppose I started there. Then I got kind of really into German history. And at school, I I read the famous book by William Shirer, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. And I know people say, oh, you know, it's it's outdated now. But 
it's very vivid <laughs> and it gives very vivid descriptions of life in Germany. And so I just became sort of a bit obsessed with German history, really. And I suppose it's always that thing with me is that I like to be different. <laughs> you know, I don't like, I could have easily gone down the road of writing about Liverpool, couldn't I? You know, or the Beatles, or I could have gone down the road of writing about, you know, what do you expect a Liverpool leader to be? Maybe you expect him to be a socialist, so could have written about socialism. So I suppose it's like, he's a scouser and he writes about Germany, but I kind of like that. I kind of like being different, if you know what I mean. I don't like being just just the same. At school, I was in a group called The Outsiders. <laughs> <laughs> so when in a lot of public discourse about the many crises Germany is facing today, people sometimes talk about the Weimarization of politics or Weimarer Verhältnisse, Weimar conditions. What have they got in their mind there? Can you paint us a picture of Weimar Germany as a whole? Well, I think the what they've got in mind when they use it now in modern usage is that is the idea of a chaotic political system that really is, you know, it's in economic trouble, you know, it, it's divided, it's politically divided, it's got a lot of violence there as well, there's violence added to it. It's really the early Weimar period that, that people talk about for Weimarization, not the middle period, 24 to 29, when Germany was more stable. So I think it's that, it's that idea of, you know, do you want to go back to chaos like they had in Weimar Germany? And of course, Weimar eventually, the chaos and the conflict eventually leads to the parliament basically being sort of circumvented by President Hindenburg, and that helps Hitler come to power. So the whole thing, it's its sort of a political system that's in a kind of meltdown. I think that's what people talk about. You know, they talk about it in terms of America, don't they? And, of course, in Britain, we've had a kind of, there's a sort of, political meltdown, although there's not some extreme party waiting in the wings here. Though in America, they have Donald Trump and it's hard to predict what he'll do if he becomes president again. The young Weimar Republic went through a very serious stress test in 1923 when a multi-layered crisis hit the country in a way that's sort of a million miles away from where we are today, if you think about inflation and political division and widespread social ructions. So how did Weimar Germany's extremists try to exploit this phenomenon and why did they not seize power at that time? I think the real key to it is that the army, first of all, it stayed neutral from being involved with the right wing. And then it defended the Republic. So in 1923, like you said, all the ingredients for an overthrow of the Weimar Republic were there. You know, you've got right wing revolt in Bavaria. You've got escalating inflation, hyperinflation. You've also got communist revolts as well in, in Saxony at the same time. So it really, all the ingredients for, for a coup are there. And then Hitler attempts, doesn't he? A, a rather pathetic coup in Munich. So I suppose it's it's those those aspects of 1923 that kind of resonate. It could have been overthrown then, but it wasn't. It was saved by the police and the army. And even Hitler admitted when he when he when he tried his coup, the famous Munich beer hall coup in Munich in. Um, November 1923, which only lasted a few hours, really. It was a, it was a pathetic, bungled affair. But Hitler said when after he was captured, I realised that the state was too strong to be overthrown from the street. So he changed his whole attitude towards it. And the left had kind of burned itself out, really. I mean, that was the last sort of effort of the left in 1923. They never again attempted any kind of armed overthrow of a local government, for example, um, or even a local, you know, a, a local area. So the, the left-wing threat to the Weimar Republic was ended, really. And the right-wing threat was kind of ended because an armed revolt overthrowing Weimar did not now look likely in 1923. And yet, um, over the next decade that, that is to come, the communists gain traction, but ultimately the Nazis take over. So what happened over the next 10 years that made the situation in 1933 very different from the one in 1923? 
Well, I suppose the 24 to 29 period, it's a sort of period of stability, although Gustav Stressemann, the, the foreign minister, said that Germany was always dancing on a volcano because Germany was taking short-term loans from America to keep its economy stable. And when they ended after the Wall Street crash, then the German economy crashed. And then the political system started not to work, really. You know, there were a succession of coalition governments. I think all in all, there were 20 coalition governments in Weimar. There were 12 different chancellors. There were eight different national elections. So it was sort of chaotic. And then, you know, Hindenburg decided that he'd try and circumvent the Reichstag by creating presidential cabinets in 1930. And they were led first by Brüning, then by Franz von Papen, then by General von Schleicher. But all of them failed because all three of those leaders were not really that well known. And in the end, Hindenburg is kind of persuaded by Franz von Papen that they can control him, the Conservatives can bring him into power and they can shackle and control him. The famous quote of Franz von Papen is that he said to Hindenburg, don't worry, we'll have him squealing in the corner like a mouse in six months. There's a common claim that crises, whether they're real or, or perceived crises, go hand in hand with extremism. From your extensive reading of German history, would you say that is generally true or does that claim obscure more than it illuminates? I'm not really sure that in, even in the Weimar period that we ever get any government that's, uh, you know, apart from von Papen's government, I'd say, and Schleicher's government. They are extremists. They are kind of, um, you know, as somebody said, Papen was a Nazi in a pinstripe suit. And I think it's a good expression because I think he was really right wing. And amongst that group, it was a small group around Hindenburg. They just thought, look, parliament doesn't work. Democracy doesn't work. Let's destroy democracy and let's create a popular right wing authoritarian government. Now, if, even if there had been no Hitler, he would have lighted on someone. Someone would have took over in the 1930s. Germany would have had a revanchist regime, I think but probably a regime that just wanted maybe to overturn the Treaty of Versailles. And maybe they would have, with a regime that was sort of headed by, I don't know, von Papen, um, was moderate in its attitude towards the um, the Western Allies, then I think that probably was possible. I don't think we would therefore have had the genocide that came with Nazism. That was unique. You get Nazism, you eventually kind of get murder and genocide. I don't think with von Papen you were going to get murder and genocide in the same way. Although he did say to Hindenburg that, you know, if if, if this Hitler experiment didn't work it might be a good idea to go down the the road of uh, emergency powers and suppress the Nazis and suppress the communists and suppress the Reichstag. So all that, all what had happened is that Weimar was perceived not to have worked. Now, in terms of its of its government, it didn't really work. You no, know, that was a that was a fair criticism of the Weimar system, that it couldn't create stability and it didn't create any kind of um, at what would I say passion. Even the people who were defending it, you know, that the, they started to go down and down in number. I suppose there was liberals, there were the social democrats. They were the kind of parties that supported the sustenance of democracy, but they were losing popularity during the period of the Weimar years. And probably the extremists had, I think they had 51% of the votes in the July 1932 election. Now you're in a bit of trouble, aren't you? When 51% of voters are voting for parties who want to overthrow the democratic system. So I think the democratic system was kind of doomed and it wasn't helped by uh, Hindenburg in particular, who was influenced by people, probably Schleicher and von Papen. They were the ones, and his, his son really, they were the ones who were in for this, let's create a popular authoritarian regime. Now in the end, Hitler became the destiny of that vision, but they couldn't control him. 
you mentioned sort of several factors there that are quite specific to Weimar Germany. So the the fact that the regime couldn't get any stability going, the kind of repeated economic crises, the different political groupings, just the lack of kind of general support and, as you say, passion for for the republic itself and the fact that more and more people turned their backs on it. So is this really a useful time period to look back on and, and learn lessons from, or is it so unique that basically it needs to be seen in its own right. So in other words, are terms like Weimarization of politics even helpful in explaining modern day situations? Can we actually learn anything from that? I think so. I, I think that if you like democracy and you favour it, I think you've really got to get out there and fight for it because I think it's a fragile thing. I think democratic systems are quite fragile. You know, they can be overthrown, you know, uh, quickly. And and it doesn't seem to be the kind of uh, willingness to kind of get out on the streets and try and fight for it. The left, for example, they saved the Weimar Republic in, in 1920 during the Cap Putsch by ordering a general strike. But in 1932, when they heard about Hitler coming to power, there was no talk of a general strike. The Prussian parliament, which was the bastion of the Social Democrats, they'd been in power there in a coalition since 1919. But yet even that fell. You know, von Papen took special powers over Prussia. So that that regime fell and there wasn't that kind of fight for the regime. No one was getting out there to fight for democracy. And that was the problem. Democracy didn't take hold with enough passion. And as we've seen, if things go wrong in democracies, the public kind of become kind of indifferent towards the politicians who are leading them. And when you get a situation, I mean, I suppose Britain is a situation where there's continual crises, it seems to me, in the Conservative Party. And the Conservative Party is one of the backbones of the two-party system. Now, luckily for Britain, we have a two-party system. Uh, and at no point have we had sort of an extreme party on one of the in one of those uh, guises, whereas the Germans didn't have a two-party system. You needed four parties to, to, to form a coalition. And really, it was a recipe for doing nothing. And if you look at those Weimar governments, the national governments, they don't do much. But the local governments do. The local governments make dramatic changes in, in places like Prussia, for example, great social welfare benefits are instituted, but not in the national scene. And I think that's the problem with with, um, with democracy. It needs somebody to fight for it. So if I was saying, you know, what, what do you need to do? You need to support, you need to go out and vote. You need to support the system. Otherwise, the system might go. If we zoom out from Germany, for a second and think about the health of liberal democracy in Europe. In general, it's clear we're going through a period where these overlapping systemic crises have destabilised politics. And we've seen in some European countries the rise of authoritarian leaders who try to capture the institutions of the state. And if you look back to this period after the First World War, Germany was by no means the only country that succumbed to these tendencies you could think about the emergence of Mussolini in Italy, or Pilsudski in Poland, or Smetana, Pats and Ulmanis in the Baltic states. Do you think we're in danger of slightly myopically focusing on the case of Germany rather than looking at a kind of broader structural problem in European democracy, both when we think about this historical period, but also about the present? I suppose if we look at that period, the First World War was the kind of generator of all these problems. It was a fact that all these soldiers came back to their countries and they felt they'd gain nothing by the war itself. So although they won the war, I mean, in Britain, for example, they, they promised a land fit for heroes and a kind of, you know, a medical system and a, and a social welfare system. And it never came about. And in Germany, there was that kind of feeling of, you know, what was that war for? We were sure... We, they they felt they were lied to by their politicians, by, you know, the Kaiser, by Hindenburg. And the, the, I think the war, World War made a big impact in Poland as well, made a big impact in Italy. 
Uh, it made a big impact in France. We forget about how much political disruption there was in France. In fact, France had the same problem as Germany, governments coming and going every five minutes. I mean, when, when, when Germany reoccupied the Rhineland, France didn't have a government. And the same thing happened when they occupied uh, Austria in 1938. So... What drove that on was the First World War and then economic crises as well. So the result of the war was that world trade was destroyed, inflation hit, the economic situation wasn't very good. And I suppose in the last few years we've had, people forget this, but, you know, the the the, the COVID pandemic was, was almost like a, like it was as bad as a world war in its kind of uh, consequences. Um, you know, and many governments have gone and all of the problems that grew out of that were, you know, high inflation. That was a First World War problem. I mean, if you stop an economy as the first, as during war, you stop economies and then start to, you know, reboot them. It's a hard thing. And we've seen it now, haven't we? We've got problems in the Netherlands. We've got right wing in the Netherlands. There's talk in France now that, you know, the Le Pen might win the next presidential election. We've got a right wing government already in Italy. There's problems in Poland, isn't there? There's problems in Hungary. It seems to me as though, and then we've got all these kind of crises, you know, in, in war, we've got Putin as well. We've got somebody who can arguably be called, you know, a, a modern day Hitler. And then we've got the Middle East cranking up again. So the world is in a tremendous amount of flux at the moment. And it's hard to predict where it will go. My view is, just as with Weimar, it's Western ideas that are that are weakening it's the idea of the West that's weakening, I think. And all those things about, you know, freedom and democracy and conspicuous consumption, they don't work anymore because a lot of the world doesn't see the, those benefits and they sort of think of the West as ineffectual anyway. And we can see that the West is being challenged. It's being challenged by China, by Putin, by other small countries who don't believe in the West anymore. So those kind of Western ideals that weren't very strong even in the interwar period and they were sort of rebooted in 1945, weren't they? And even then there was tension, but I think the West is in a kind of, um, it's in a crisis for sure. We ought to wrap things up here, I think, since we have not one but two historians of modern Germany here and going on for too long might lead to the Weimarization of this podcast. <laughs> Can't we have a general strike and stop it? <laughs> I doubt that. You know what happens when you do, so let's let's not. <laughs> so we better have wrap things up um as you know as you said. Thank you so much for talking to us about the Weimar years today. Okay, thank you. And aside from your own excellent books on the subject, is there any other reading or, or viewing material that you would recommend for our listeners? Uh, Weimar, I think it depends. A lot of books have been on, on culture in Weimar. So there's, there's a, I think it's Eric Weitz's book is very good on, on culture. I would also say that uh, Detlef Pukart, his book on Weimar is, is very good. And there's quite a lot of good books on, you know, 1923. There's two books on that that have come out, one by an Irish historian called Williams and the other one by uh, Volker Ulrich. That's a translation. I think those books came out last year in Germany and were translated, but they were in German in the first inkling. And, of course, there are the biographies of Hitler, you know, by uh, Ulrich himself, Kershaw. So you know, there's plenty of reading on it, I think. I think the strength of my book is that it's a kind of a political history, really, because I, I didn't feel as though I could do... I mean, if I'd just gone into culture, the book would have been twice as long as it was. So I just thought, I'll do the history of the political situation because nobody's really read about that. They don't know about that. And that might be something new. And then I'll have kind of cultural highlights. Now, you know, if you go down that direction, I suppose there's, there's still room there for a, a new cultural history. And my book can be the kind of political history, uh, I think. Great. Thank you very much. That concludes our episode on The New Germany, a special English language podcast from the Kerber Stiftung with me, Katja Hoyer. And me, Oliver Moody. We are now in our third season. If you have missed the previous two, you can find them wherever you get your podcasts. 
And if you want to find us to tell us how much you've enjoyed this podcast or otherwise, we are both on X, previously known as Twitter, under at Hoyer underscore Cat and at Oliver N. Moody. Tara, as they say in Liverpool. And Chow, as they say in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs>